let's get started. So today uh, we're picking up from last week. Uh, last week we spoke about visualizing complex systems. Um, today in specific, we're going to talk about visualizing relationships between uh, things in that in the in a complex system and also creating hypotheses. Um, like I said, I've been uh, doing five years experience. I've got five years experience in research and design for social good. Uh, we've been doing these weekly coaching clinics for, I was wrong last time. I said four weeks. It's act, it had actually been six weeks. So now it's the seventh week. Um, and I, before coronavirus, I was working in coaching teams around the world. So I went to places like Bhutan, Marshall Islands, China, Africa, I haven't been to America or Canada yet, but I think that's that's where I want to go next. Um, all right, so last week we spoke about complex systems and we said it, basically a complex system um, is, um, so for uh, some examples are like healthcare systems or transport systems or employment systems. And we said the complex system is an interconnected set of elements that are organized in a way that achieves a function or a purpose, right? So you could argue, for example, I mean, that's, this is not always the case, but you could argue that the health system is uh, supposed to, you know, take care of people who are sick, right? That's the purpose of the system and the system is organized. Obviously that's, you know, you could have arguments depending on, on where you live. Um, we spoke about the goal of visualizing a system. Uh, like Bishan was saying earlier, it's not, um, or he was referring to earlier, it's not to kind of, you know, get a mathematical equation in terms of like, if you do this, this will happen uh, because that's basically impossible in a complex system. Like you don't actually know what's going to happen uh, unless you test it. Uh, but the go goal of visualizing a complex system really is to kind of have it concrete enough that it, that you can tell a story around it, but also um, with enough detail that you can take an action, right? So you can create a hypothesis and then you can go and test that hypothesis. All right, so we spoke also about two types of thinking. The first one we spoke about was systems thinking, right? Which, which basically helps us understand what's the problem that we need to solve. Like what's happening in the system and you know, what's not working as, as it should. Uh, and we call this zooming out, right? And it's kind of like looking at a highway and you know, seeing all the cars and seeing all the little people. And the second type of thinking is design thinking. And it's really looking at how is the problem affecting people, right? Like what's the actual tangible impact functionally or emotionally or psychologically on a person of, ex of experiencing this problem? So that's kind of the difference between systems thinking and design thinking. And we talk about design thinking as zooming in and really kind of empathizing with people and trying to understand their experience. Um, so the last thing that we spoke about were system components uh, and we started to visualize uh, the healthcare system and that's what uh, we'll be working on again today. And we spoke about like different things that you could uh, visualize. So the first thing is like, who's in a system and it could be like people or organizations or governments or policies. Uh, what things do they use, right? And it's things like, you know, a hospital bed or data, or, you know, they need money to spend on this, on this resource. Uh, we spoke about how they relate to each other. So, you know, like for example, a government will release a new policy and all of a sudden it will be easier or harder to buy land in that specific country, right? So, um, you know, what's the impact, what's, what's, what are the relationships between these different entities? And what does that tell us? Uh, the second last one is the purpose driving a system. So again, like you can argue that, you know, again, this is pretty arguable, but you could say that the housing system is designed to uh, give people a house that, you know, fits their lifestyle, right? Obviously that's not always the case, uh, not for everyone. And then what are the shared beliefs? And that's kind of like underlying uh, beliefs, basically that people don't really talk about, but they have. All right, cool. So what we'll do is I'll, um, what we'll do now is I'll put you into groups. Last time we spoke about the one small step. Uh, so I'll put you into groups where there's people from uh, that were here last week with us. Uh, and they'll talk about, you know, what is it that they committed to last week and how they went with that. So that should take us about two minutes. So people who were here last week, how did your kind of one small step go? Like if you give like a thumbs up or thumbs down type thing, what would you say? Kyle's good. Ruben, Tom. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Bishan. All right, cool. That's good. Um, all right. Can you see my screen with the pink, with the red, red, pink, yep. but orange. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, I guess it's important, especially for us to remember like why we're talking about uh, systems thinking um, and why we're kind of visualizing this. And it's uh, especially for, for new people who are kind of, you know, joining this as a, as a, as a user experience or design uh, clinic. So in order, so this is like my, my kind of uh, thinking, right. In order to create a product or service that meets people needs, like, not just like, oh, it's a cool product or service, but it actually meets people needs. 
uh, people's needs. We need to understand the system, right? Uh, and only then can we make sure that our product or service will solve a real needs and nudge the system to a better future. Um, so that's that's kind of why we're talking about, um, you know, even though we, we want to kind of create these, uh, you know, products or services, this is why we're talking about systems thinking because uh, to me, all the best services uh, or products that I worked on um, have been the ones where you try to understand the system first and, you know, you, you test your idea with that lens, not just, you know, come up with an idea that you think is solving a problem and it's not really solving a problem. Um, all right, cool. So let's uh, quickly talk about visualizing relationships. Um, so the first question we have is why could it be important to map the relationships between things in a system? Um, Good to know which system or which components rely on each other. So if one fails, mm -hmm. the impact that will have overall. So if this part fails, all these other ones will. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Hector, what are you going to say? Uh, yeah, it's really important because we need to know how they interact and how each, each one affect uh, the other one. So mm -hmm. in, in that, that, that's my, my opinion. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, to add to what Tom and Hector said, to understand not only just how they work and interact with each other, but to also understand the context and the environment under which they are working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good. Because that, that changes things, right? If, you, if the environment changes, like coronavirus, right? Everyone started either losing their jobs or, or working from home. And that kind of had a massive impact on, you know, our relationships with work, but also our relationships with systems like the healthcare system, for example, right? Like a lot of doctor appointments uh, in a country, say like Australia, have become like over the phone or, you know, via something like Zoom, right? So, um, cool. Anyone else? I think like another factor would be possibly overlooking something that already exists in the system and focusing on a problem that already ha maybe has a sort of solution that exists already. Yep. Who wrote the identify semantic quality between relationships? Do they want to talk about that? Oh yeah, that was me. Um, not much to talk about it. Just, I think from a linguistic standpoint, I think it's important to, just understand the quality of the meaning between relationships. And I think that's determ determined by, you know, context and specifics and circumstances. But I do think that uh, maybe there's like a certain level of codification and maybe being able to visualize that can help bring out to see uh, some kind of, you know, higher quality between mm -hmm. those relationships. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. All right, cool. So we'll call it there. So we got, we got a few interesting things actually that I don't think of, which is kind of like, what Matt was talking about before in terms of, uh, you know, understanding the context and Hannah was talking about that as well. So to understand how partnerships work together, helps you find leverage. Uh, understand the context of interrelated elements within a system, understand where to apply leverage for change, overlooking a potential solution that already exists in a different part of the system. Yeah. And that's actually some of, some of uh, the projects that I've run is like, it's not actually creating, trying to create this new thing. It's trying to figure out why this thing has been so successful and then trying to scale it up uh, as opposed to, yeah, kind of, you know, coming up with a brand new idea. Cool. So this is some of the, some of the thinking that I was, that I, that some of the things I was thinking about. It's uh, the first thing is relationships between things create complexity. And I'm using like things very loosely here in terms I'm talking about like actors and entities and, uh, and other, other things that exist in the system they create the most complexity and they're also uh, potentially where you could uh, find an intervention point, right? Like if you figure out that, you know, the relationship, for example, between, you know, the emergency department and the rest of the hospital isn't, uh, you know, isn't very helpful, right? Or, you know, the emergency department struggling to, you know, uh, uh, give people who don't need like emergency care to the hospital or to other parts of the health system, then you can really focus on that. Uh, and then the third reason in the middle there, which, uh, which is that things, things will be affected in different ways depending on what's affecting it and how it's being affected, right? So if we understand, for example, that the government like sets the policy in, um, intent, right? Then we know if the government changes policy, then that will have kind of um, downstream effects on the rest of the system. Uh, and in terms of um, visualizing relationships, it helps just to connect entities to begin with or connect different things in the system and then talk about as a team, talk about, you know, I connected it because I thought, you know, this influenced uh, this other thing and then talk about, and you'll discuss like, why do I think, or why do we think this affects it in that way and not, not another way. Um, cool. Awesome. So for the next 15 minutes, I'll split you back into groups. Um, 
for people who are here last last week, I think it's probably more helpful if you work on your group uh, or on the map that your group um, did last week. So feel, let me know if you're in the wrong group. Uh, so for the next 15 minutes, again, we're going to kind of, you know, people who were here last week, they'll explain what they mapped. Um, people who are who are here, like uh, who who's, have just come this week, you can uh, kind of add and, and move things around and then talk about, you know, what things do they use? How do they relate to each other? And really the, the most important one is the third one there, which is how they relate to each other, right? And creating those relationships. Um, cool. Any questions? Uh, we want one person from each group to tell us what they were uh, kind of working on. Who wants to start? Can't say I was uh, completely uh, clear on what I, what, what I was doing, um, but there were a few, um, I linked a few stickies. You know, I, I mostly focused on like the, the relationship between government and industry. Mm -hmm. I, I linked a few of those. Mm -hmm. um, so on that level, I connected some lines. You know, I, I put government at the top, you know, kind of outside the, the, the bullseye, the circle, and I connected it to the sticky that says regulation, and then I have regulation going to pharmaceutical industry, going to uh, insurance, comp insurance industry, and yeah medical equipment industry. And I also added a, a direct line between the patient and government, you know, mm -hmm. presumably any, everyone's a voter. So they have a yeah. kind of a, a say in this, uh, mm -hmm. however, uh, however tenuous of an effect they have, right. To, yeah. to government policies. But that's, that's about the level I have. Right? Nice. Nice. That's a good, that's a good level to be playing at. Um, cool. Does anyone want to share from the second group? I will go to your map. Hannah, Tom, Bishan, not. Tom, you want to do the honors? Um, well, have um, a crack. No pressure. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, largely just drawing a relationship between these these agents here, uh, whether positive or negative. Um, I think I was mainly looking at with a healthcare system looking after a patient. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, the patient's going to be the most important thing for everyone involved in that system, such as businesses, such as uh, insurance companies. You know, they're there to make profit, not necessarily look after a, after a, a patient. But that's probably part of their ethos, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But it does show you how some boxes start to get... They don't all point inwards, I guess. It's, it's some of them point yeah. across or even outwards. That's awesome, Tom. And I think with positive and negative relationships, uh, the context we were using that initially was kind of causal loop diagrams. In When we're visualizing complex system, it's very difficult to say whether, like it's very difficult to kind of objectively say, right, this relationship is completely positive or this relationship is completely negative. Uh, the best that you can say is there's a relationship there, right? And then you actually have to kind of like do your own research and things to understand you know, what's happening in that relationship. It's kind of like a marriage, right? There's like positive moments, there's negative moments. It's never just like one way or the other. Well, hopefully it's never one. I mean, hopefully it's not all negative. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah so it, fit, ignore the colors when we're kind of initially mapping systems because then when you're kind of intervening, you might say, okay, we think the relationship, for example, between government and the medical board certification is an optimal so let's do research to understand what the relationship is and the the visualizing that isn't just going to be one arrow to say that they they affect each other it's going to be like they affect each other in this way um all right cool any questions uh, about that piece we're going to quickly talk about creating hypotheses yeah. um i have a i have a question yeah so when do you when do you say uh, that the relationship that you have visualized is wrong good um so so this is this is again what we were talking about um that's a really good question Bishan. i want to kind of acknowledge that first second this is exactly what we're talking about right you, you want to build a visual um system of the map right that you can then show to people and kind of mm -hmm. validate with them right so for example you you could go to 
a, someone from the government representative and talk about, okay, what's your relationship like with the medical board certification or the medical medical board, right? What happens in that? And then you can also go to someone from the medical board certificate and say, you know, here's, this, here's the map that we're kind of visualizing. This is how we see it. You know, what looks right and what looks wrong about it and then kind of iterate over time. So that's what we mean when we say, that map needs to, you, you actually, you're actually using it as a tool to validate um, your assumptions and things with, uh, with other people. Okay. And in order to do that, you have to actually engage broader than just, you know, your little team of four people uh, because you, you, you don't have the, the experience and you go to patients and say, okay, what's, if that's of interest, right? Their relationship or patients are of interest. Hopefully they are then you'd say, okay, what's your experience like? How are you, for example, interacting with doctors and so on and so forth? Um, right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, actually, I've got one. Um, yeah. So I got into a healthy debate today with one of my teammates uh, about the map that I've been putting together around storytelling within the map. Um, mm -hmm. She, as a US ex researcher, is very focused on making recommendations as the output from her research. Yeah. For me, I was trying to focus on the POV that I was researching and the problem statement I had in front of me, but otherwise wanted to be very hands off to make sure it was out there and valid and then let everybody else sort of get that common language from it. Um, but we were, we were trying to find that balance of how much do you want to influence and how much do you want to drive with this versus how much do you just want to stay neutral? Mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good. Uh, and I see, so I've kind of been like, I've had roles where I'm a UX researcher and you know, people just want to, they don't want to know, like they don't, they're not super interested in the problem. They're more interested in like, you know, what, what can I do to fix it? Um, so I think the, the, the issue with complex systems often is that it's not, like you're actually not sure about a lot of things, right? Whereas if you're t doing like usability testing of a system, you're like, yeah, like, you know, people completely miss that page. So we need to make it more prominent. Like, like there's a very clear cause and effect. So it is kind of difficult. What, so w the next thing that we're going to talk about creating hypotheses will, um, will help answer that question, Kyle. Uh, but after it, feel free to tell me I didn't answer my question, but well, I think that was a perfect segue then. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for that. I am um, always helping me out. All right. So we're going to talk quickly about creating hypotheses. Um, now here's two kind of uh, assumptions or hypotheses, right? One is more data equals better patient outcomes. And the other is more data equals worse patient. All right. So more data, better patient outcomes, more data, worse patient outcomes. Uh, and then again, show the competing hypotheses. Like why do these people think, that way, right? And one thinks it's gonna to lead to better insights, the other person thinks it's gonna to lead to more confusion, right? And then this is kind of a way of integrating them, right? So, you know, if you, if you kind of really question why these people think or why these hypotheses are the way they are, right? You can actually integrate them and say, you know, more data is gonna to lead to more confusion initially, right? Which will lead to potentially worse patient outcomes, right? Or at least it will, you know, it will stay the same. Uh, you won't really necessarily see it, see an improvement, but because people are like collecting all this data or, you know, the health department's collecting all this data and they're not seeing like benefit, then they want to, they might want to invest into getting insights, right. Which will lead to better insights, which will lead to better, out better patient outcomes. Yeah. Does that make sense now? Cool. Awesome. Thanks Chen Yu. Always saving the day. Um, so you could also map what this looks like, um, kind of like over time, right? So you could say like, you know, hypothetically speaking, you would be collecting, um, you'd be collecting all the, all the data, right? So it, it would kind of increase uh, in a linear fashion. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether, whether it's exponential or linear, right? And then you can say, okay, investment in data initially will be low, right? Because they're just like collecting data. They're not really investing in like getting insights. And then there will, there was kind of be a peak where they're investing in kind of getting insights from the data and then it will flatten again. Right. And then you can say, okay, well, if that's the case initially, like the more data you collect, the less, uh, the quality or the worse the data quality is going to be. 
right? And then as they invest, obviously there's, there's like a lag between investing and actually getting high, high quality data or insights from the data. And then, you know, that slowly kind of increases. Yeah. And then you can say, okay, patient outcomes will initially improve. And maybe it's because patients are, you know, see collecting uh, more data is like as a good thing. You know, I think that the government's going to use this um, for good. Right. And then actually what happens is people start getting confused. And then, you know, once they invest and they start to kind of get insights, then patient outcomes improves. Does that make sense about kind of like a story that you can say uh, that you can share? And this all comes from like a system map, right? And identifying, okay, what are the assumptions or hypotheses we're making about this system, right? And then how could we kind of t tell a story about that? Any questions? Actually, Abraham, if you don't mind, can you explain this again? It's a little confusing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. All right. Let's, uh, any, does anyone have any other questions that uh, I could answer as well while I'm, ex while I'm explaining it? Everyone's all good? All right. This is, Just, this is uh, actually... Yeah, it, um, if you could give a little explanation to each of the line and the, how it maybe affects, you know, patient outcome and all that. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. All right, awesome. Bishan, that's why you're after as well? Yes. Uh, the, uh, no, the, how is the data quality affecting the patient outcomes, basically? Okay, cool. All right, awesome. So mm -hmm. let's, let's just focus on data, right? The pink line, and it's over time, right? And the higher the line is, the more or the better the, the thing is, right? So data, the more data you collect, the more data you have, right? And so yesterday, like today, you'll have more data than yesterday because, you know, yesterday you've already have the data of patient one to 10 and now you have patient 10 to 20 or 11 to 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that grows yeah. kind of over time. Um, initially, right. The data will be pretty hard to interpret, right. That's, that's what I, that's the yellow line, right. So as you collect more data, right. It's harder to interpret because you have more data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But then yeah. so the, the red or kind of blood orange line is saying that investment uh, in data will kind of start as, you know, we've, we're investing in just collecting data and then it will kind of increase to say, you know, we will invest in actually getting insights from that data, right? And then it will go flat again because, you know, they're not, gonna, they're not just going to invest forever. Mm -hmm. And because that happens, right, the yellow line kind of, uh, slowly grows, right? It doesn't grow as quickly because there's like a lag or there's okay. like a time delay between, you know, how much the money they're investing in getting insights from the data and the data quality, right? But because they have the data, eventually, you know, they start building capability towards better insights. Does that make sense mm -hmm. so far? Yeah, I think yeah. the argument here is that the more data you collect, the more insights you have. Yeah, if you have the capability of actually collecting that in those insights. Right. Yes. But if you don't, then you have all this data. Right. And this is like a typical problem with actually a lot of like uh, organizations is that they have so much data that they don't know like what it means. It's not actionable data. It's not like, you know, if we kind of introduce yeah. a health clinic in this sector, that will, that will reduce infections of this specific disease. Right. It's not that level of data. It's like, you know, we're seeing this many people in, in this country or in this state who have this disease, but it's not, you know, high quality in terms of like being actionable. True. Yeah. Uh, and then, so the impact of that is that initially like patient outcomes might improve, not, not because, uh, not because of the data, but because patients are seeing the data being collected. Right. So they, you know, they feel good about, or they feel more confident about the, the, uh, you know, the health outcomes they're getting or the, the service they're getting from clinicians. Right. And then, actually what happens is because it causes so much confusion because you know, you, you keep having this data that's causing confusion, the health outcome, the patient outcomes decrease, right? Or so they're worse. And then once you start investing in the data and you start investing in the capability to actually interpret the data and have it actionable, then the patient outcomes increase. True. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Chen Yu. Yep. Yep. Would be, uh, you're probably going to get into this later, but like in your experience, what, what did that data processing step look like? 
Uh, what do you mean? Because uh, basically what you're saying is like not just collecting raw data is not necessarily going to improve outcomes, but mm -hmm. there needs to be like an interpretive and a processing step, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm guessing you from, I'm asking if you, from your experience, like what did that step look like from some, maybe some of the projects that you worked on that had to sort through a lot of data and, yeah, and cool. actually so, make it actionable. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, in one, in one project, and again, I won't be able to kind of share this publicly, but I'll, I'll talk about it because we're kind of in a private space. Uh, in one project, we're looking at the health system, ironically enough, in the, the place that I live. And we were kind of engaging with like, we're seeing like all the infections data, all the data from emergency departments, you know, all the data of like how many patients are, how long people are staying in hospital beds and so on and so forth. Um, and basically what, what they wanted was like a strategy to identify like what does high care quality look like for patients, right? And their families, right? So we had like a bunch of interviews, you know, surveys. We had like a lot of ways of collecting data, both from p patients and their families and also staff. Uh, and that, that's like one of my favorite projects. Uh, just, you know, getting to like sit, to, sit next to someone, you know, in their, in their hospital room and talk to them about their experience of like healthcare and, you know, what got them here and hearing their life story. I really enjoy that stuff. Um, anyway, so that, that actually looks like having a data scientist, right? Look through like the data, both qualitative and quantitative and kind of identifying patterns. Right. And then once you identify patterns, it's not just about saying, you know, here's a pattern, let's, let's fix it. It's actually about, again, validating that pattern with, with people. Right. So you, you might go to a patient and say, okay, we we think we're seeing this pattern. What, 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 what are your thoughts on this? You know, does your experience validate or invalidate this, this kind of hypothesis and same thing with clinicians and, you know, nurses and so on and so forth. And then eventually, right. You come to a recommendation that says, you know, if you do this, we think this will happen. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, and we're going to talk about this, I think next week, probably, uh, kind of creating fail safe experiments, right? Where you, you test that hypothesis, right? But you test it in a way that if you fail, uh, it's not catastrophic, you know, it's not someone dies. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? So it's mm -hmm. like actually designing and testing uh, an experiment to test your hypothesis or test your idea or the solution you're proposing in a way that's safe and can show you, you know, whether this is succeed or gonna, or has the potential to succeed or fail. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yep. Cool. Ruben, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Like how prone are we to over complexity is the system? Because one might think that the more data you have, the, the more certainty you will have as a system, but sometimes correlation doesn't, it's not the same as causation. So you yeah. may have different patterns that interact with each other that might appear to be related, but they aren't in reality. So mm. you will start having a bigger, a level of uncertainty of the system. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree, Ruben. I think, I think you're right. There is correlation there, but it does kind of break down at some point because you can have, you know, so much data that it's, that it's, it, it, it just like, again, too complex for, for anyone to kind of interpret. So it's about like looking at what are the kind of key pieces of data that we really need to focus on and almost like drawing a boundary, right? Like, saying, for example, like the health there, say the education system, they would look at like whether your parents, for example, are separated, you know, how much time your parents spend time with you to kind of help you uh, learn how much time you're spending at school, what your attendance is like, right? But say, looking at someone's like hair color, that's not very helpful, right? Uh, it, you know, in say in Nazi Germany, it might be right, because you might have better, better, um, better education outcomes depending on people's skin color, for example, or, or hair color. Right. And then you would argue and say, actually, this is like a helpful thing and let's just test it. Let's see, you know, does that have a correlation with, uh, with educational outcomes or is this like a, again, like a piece of data that we don't actually need. Yeah. But yeah, I would say definitely kind of like visualizing complex systems. You can kind of get it, too complex um and i can show some examples of that next next week kind of uh system maps that are just too complex um all right so um that's it for today we're gonna just uh, close briefly with one small step
uh, again. So again, just put your name and kind of what you're gonna what you're gonna uh, commit to next week, and we'll check in when we get back. I'm gonna try to start a website. <laughs> nice. I've been talking about that for a bit, so I'm just gonna start something. <laughs> yeah, just do it. Kind of like I literally yeah. just did that website that I posted on Slack in like one night last night. So <laughs> it's easier than you think. Oh yeah, I'm also going to uh, add posts in Slack because I've not done that yet. <laughs> oh yeah, please do. Does everyone have access to our Slack group? Uh, not me, Abram. Okay, cool. Um, um, I don't. I don't either. either. This is Don. Okay, cool. Awesome. Stephanie. What I might do is in the summary email that I'll send uh, later today. So probably your like midnight. Um, I will post a. I'll post a link to the Slack channel so you can join and introduce yourself. Uh, I think Stephanie is asking for access to the board, Abraham. Uh, I to just received an board? email. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me. Thanks, Bushan. Yeah. Okay, Stephanie, you should have access now. I just, uh, I just approved it. You should be receiving an email, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else want to talk about the small step? So, Ibrahim, I think I'll, I'll go back to uh, understanding the four types of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to actually take this, uh, take the exercise of building the relationships in the preventative care uh, forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give it a try in my own way. And I'll awesome. put it on the board so that next week uh, we can all, uh, if possible, have a discussion on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And feel free to... Um take a screenshot of it as well and post it on Slack and then we can discuss it there too. Kind of sure, like in the middle of the week. That was, yeah. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Who's going to finish their pending UX research book? Is that you, Ruben? No, it's me, Hector. It's All right, Hector. Right I'll put your name next to it. Cool. Awesome. Is everyone have one now? Does everyone have one now? Sorry, come again, Abraham. Does everyone did everyone um, put their um, small step? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, the last thing that we that we want to do is just kind of reflect on what worked well today, um, what we could improve. Uh, feel free to kind of speak up. It, it's usually good hearing a, a few voices. Um, oh, and what you want to cover next time as well. Next time we will talk about uh, actually like we'll actually kind of work on creating hypotheses, right. To say like, we think, you know, if, if we do this, this is going to happen and it's what, what it's going to look uh, like over time. And then we're going to talk about how we test those hypotheses. Is there any session plan regarding uh, behavioral sciences Sorry? or behavioral economics? Do you have in mind to give a session uh, related to behavioral economics or behavioral sciences? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do a session uh, and we, maybe maybe one session we can talk about like the different types of interventions, right? Uh, and then one of yeah. them could be like behavior change interventions. Oh, sure. Uh, but yeah, if you, have a, if you have a specific kind of question around behavior science, I've done a little bit. I haven't done a lot, but I have done a little bit. Uh, yeah, feel free to, to let me know and we can cover that. Okay, great. Thanks. Bishan, we gave you access to Slack last time. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. I know. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much. No worries. That's a good point. That's a good point, um, Kyle. 
around being kind of too complex. <laughs> yeah, you could you could make a complex system out of a lot of things, I agree. <laughs> Not that we weren't up for the challenge. Yeah, I get yeah. Yeah. I think I think what we need to actually do, Abraham, is uh, have an actual uh, decode an actual system. Mm -hmm. uh, so pick pick a real system, pick a real life complex or a complicated system, and then see how we can, from your perspective, how we can decode it. Mm. And yeah, yeah, because I think uh, what happens is, and, and again, I'm not saying this because healthcare was too complicated or complex, but I'm seeing it from uh, the perspective of a, of a newcomer, mm -hmm. somebody who understands systems thinking only from a high level. Yeah. Having, uh, having something that is uh, dismantled in front of you and then put together would mm -hmm. probably give them a better idea of yeah, how yeah. systems thinking work. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, um, I'll not, have a think about yeah, and not spend too much time, maybe uh, 30 minutes. Uh, just the way you explained the relationship between data and insights in one of your slides, uh, just the same way. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'll, I'll take that feedback on board. Okay, cool. Um, cool. That's it for today. Uh, thanks again for making the time. And it's good to have so many new people with us, uh, Ross and Matt and Dawn and Stephanie. And thank you. Thank you so much, Abraham. Ruben. No, not Ruben. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, cool. Awesome. I will, um, I will send a Slack channel. If you're, um, so I have, I have this like competition. Thanks, Stephanie. I have this competition running. Um, I posted on the Slack channel, but I know a few people haven't, don't have access to that. So I'm, I'm building this new website and there's an Easter egg. And if you can find the Easter egg and uh, either email it to me or, um, or, um, or just, you know, Slack me, uh, I'll give you 20% off. So uh, yeah, have a, have a crack at it. Don't spend too much, too much time. Uh, it is difficult to find, but um, yeah, that's, that's the website. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can keep the discussion going on Slack this week. Ibram, question. How will yep. we know that we found the Easter egg? Um, you will find the words Easter egg when you click on it. Okay. <laughs> that was too obvious, isn't it? Or a photo of an egg or both. I'll add the, the, the emoji of an egg. That way, you know, you know, you found it. Sorry, come again. I'll, I'll add an emoji of an egg. That way, you know, you found ah, it. okay. Okay. And is there, is it browser specific or it works across browsers? No, no, it work across. <laughs> Yeah, that's what's going to be closed now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually getting down to what actually the Easter egg is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much for making the time. It was uh, good seeing everyone right. again. Um, and yeah, shout out on Slack if you need anything. I'll send, I'll send everyone the link in a few hours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.